there's the existential one that the big question, why are we here on this earth? You know, you know what, what's our future? You know, that's something you have to sort out for yourselves. <laughs> and your beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> however, <laughs> however, what I would say is you need to have sorted it out. So great leadership is the ability to create a vision based on opportunities and challenges and develop a reliable strategy that through trust, integrity, influence, engagement, motivation, leads to a goal that has higher moral value. So let's work backwards on that definition. So moral value. But how do you differentiate Lincoln, Washington, Churchill, and Mandela in his later life? And to me, the critical thing is the moral value. They were great leaders, the latter ones, because they had a sense of moral value for the future. For us in medicine, the big benefit from a moral value point of view is, is about patient care. So we have, in a sense, a north compass for us when it comes to that. We talked a bit about motivation. It's always a, a challenge. We talked about goals, and that's why we measure our outcomes and metrics uh, because it's about patient care and doing that better. Let me talk about the issue of integrity, trust, and influence. A reliable product, you treat it nicely, empathize with you, you buy the product, and it really works for you, you become an advocate for that product. And the same applies to our patients. If they trust us, they have a great experience with us, they become our strongest advocates. And I think all of you who have been in practice in a, for a while now know that you have a lot of patients who come back to see you or their friends or family come because of the product that you've delivered. We used to talk about what's the most important thing when we choose residents. Yeah, integrity is important and so on, but reliability is a critical part. So as an institution, we have to be reliable in the delivery of care. Now that means no safety events, no wrong side surgeries, great product, happy customers. So reliability is the first one. Another one is access. And this was something that Toby pushed very hard and it is access for patients to come here. And the last couple of years we've certainly seen, as we've opened our doors more, we've had more patients uh, come in and see us. I think engagement should be right up there, maybe before reliability. And as an institution, it's good to see that the institution is concentrating more on engagement of the staff. And, and I've always maintained if engagement is low, then that trickles down in, in the care of patients. And so that's why, from my point of view, engagement's very high up. And you know, Christine Jealous has kindly taken on the task of particularly addressing uh, that aspect. Respect. I, I think that a lot of us as physicians are motivated by being respected by our colleagues and our patients. When it comes to trust, there is a, a lawyer by the name of Charles Green who's sort of come up with this formula for trust. And I think it's a, a reasonable thing to start with. And he says that people develop trust in somebody if they're reliable, they have credibility. In other words, other people think and their experience has been good with them and there's a level of intimacy, involvement in other people's lives. And it's inversely related to self-absorption, self-promotion, going back to what Joe was saying. And I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. Now, if you want to delve further into this, the, the one book that I think is useful, and this is Stephen H.R. Covey, and he has written a book, The Speed of Trust. And I think that's a reasonable book to read. 
And the point being that you really cannot get people to follow you as a leader if they don't trust you. And they need to feel that you are engaged in their future and they can trust you to do the best possible for, for them and their future. Internally, what the leaders do is they build alliances with the influencers within their group. They arbitrate fa uh, fights and make sure everybody's treated fairly. And they protect the weak and those who are at the lower rungs. And so when it comes, for example, with us, our people who collect blood, our orderlies, etc., they're absolutely critical to our institution. And obviously our nurses and women, we have to protect everybody. And that's part of the leadership puzzle. Integrity is, I think, straightforward. But I find it interesting how often people have a problem with that. Um, and that goes back to the internal narrative. Um, but integrity is critical. Um, Eisenhower said that without integrity, there's no leadership. And I think that's a very important point. And so as you interview residents for potential for the job, you know, think about that. What's their energy level? Can they energize other people as leaders? And then the secondary ones that he also mentions are execute on a strategy or a plan, and then the edge to make the tough decisions. I think there are a couple more that apply for us in medicine. Empathy, I think, is very important. Educating our subsequent leaders is important. Experimenting and, for lack of a better term, innovating. So that's an I, obviously, innovating. So innovation, looking at new things. How can we develop new things within HVI to continue to lead into the future? So it's not just device innovation. It's managing patients' processes, innovation. You know, for example, a heart failure team has their checklist, they're looking through at this again, and they're going to innovate on how patients are managed. And so it's not innovation, new device, it's innovation, new procedures, new ways of managing patients that are going to keep us at the forefront. We want to have the best teams with the best people doing less invasive procedures with the best outcomes. But at the same time, not forgetting that we take care of the most complex patients. How do I become a better person? How to become a better surgeon, cardiologist, interventionist? Um, and that's all part of our mantra as physicians. I mean, we're always trying to make ourselves better. The analogy that I think is useful is actually racing car uh, driving and sports cars and Formula One, uh, which is something I spent time with when I was younger, working as a doctor on the track. And so for racing car drivers, you have to, first of all, learn your track. And you have to completely memorize it, just as we <coughs> memorize procedures. And the really good racing car drivers the first time they're on a new track, they watch videos and the simulators now, but they actually walk the track to find every little bump and they memorize the whole track. And you may have seen on TV or YouTube, the racing car drivers driving or drawing blindfold folded the race tracks. That's how well they know them. So they memorize the track and then they learn how to drive at maximum traction, and it's really about the corners. Now, just like surgery, fast is not fast. Smooth is fast. And just like surgery and procedures, you want a smooth procedure, and that's much more efficient. But the obvious big thing with a racing car driver is his life's on the line when we operate as the patient's 
life is on the line. So we try and improve our, ourselves. In our modern era, you have to think about your own life too, your relationships. Your family, your kids, your friends have friendships, groups that you meet with outside of work to give you that resilience. I sometimes say to residents that the way to think about your career is a bit like the way you invest in stocks. Unless you're an expert, diversify, okay? Your life, diversify it. Do some research, do some educating, spend time with your family, master your skills, but diversify your life. I think there, for our future, there's tremendous opportunity for us as individuals and in our personal growth and leadership. I think there's tremendous opportunity from the point of view of growing our practices, uh, whether that's vascular surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, cardiology. We've got lots of stuff to do.